Welcome back to Decouple. We have a very special guest and a very special topic today, a much awaited topic, um, one that we've let leak on several occasions. And I think uh, there's a lot of appetite to understand this topic. Um, but first, um, to reintroduce Mark Nelson, I think everybody who listens to this podcast regularly would know him unless it's been uh, you've joined in the last two months because um, we haven't seen much of Mark recently. But we're going to fix that all today with a very interesting discussion about what the hell is going on with French nuclear. Um, you know, I'm thinking of like a Hamlet kind of title here. There's something rotten in the kingdom of Francia, but it's a republic. Anyway, Mark, welcome back. It's been far too long. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and we're, we're turning to a topic that is possibly the most important in the world of nuclear, in my opinion. And that's yeah. France and its nuclear fleet. Specifically, <laughs> France, its nuclear fleet and its failures. Yeah. And I mean, all the more disappointing because I think a lot of us point to France um, as a real model for a build-out, right? 54 it's reactors the promised land. In, built in 20 years and decarbonized not only the electricity, but a lot of their heating. Um, I think 55% of their rail network is electric. Um, you know, so they, they did the hard energy path and they overbuilt um, some great clean energy sources. And that seemed to be going well for some time, but... Right now, um, particularly with the geopolitical implications of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this was France's moment to shine. And unfortunately, should have been. this is France's shame. Been. So, yeah. Right. I'm editorializing I think, too much. Jump in, Mark. Jump in. Sure. Well, you you say the hard energy path. One of our previous episodes talked about Amory Lovins and his famous essay for foreign affairs on the soft energy path, which is, uh, say, the environmental vision where you get a can of oil and pour it into a nice oil burner right there at your stove in order to cook a little meal. Um, and then the hard energy path where you have these massive, uh, aesthetically uninteresting, if you don't know about energy, aesthetically uninteresting nuclear plants that just crank out huge amounts of electricity that people just use all the time. And see, that was the, be that was the hard energy path because it's big, scary technologies and the soft energy, like pouring oil into your own house's burner out in a cozy cabin in the woods, that's the soft energy path. And then as different technologies came on, like maybe slightly better solar panels or slightly taller wind turbines, it try, they tried to get that included in like sort of soft energy, even though as they now say, we need a big electricity grid to carry the energy. Right. So a lot of confusion, but France did everything pretty much that Amory Lovin said should not be the basis of energy. And they built out, uh, well, they ended up with 62 reactors uh, that they built in a relatively short period of time. The majority of those built in a frantic 10, 15 year period in the uh, late 70s to um, early 90s. And, and so you know, we, like we, you said, we, this is yeah. this was a goal for many nuclear people because mm -hmm. we saw a real world example. No one can ever say it didn't happen that yeah. an entire society built around, expanded a, beyond its previous size and wealth on a base of nuclear energy. Right. So they did something that's actually somewhat rare. They appeared to permanently expand their their per capita wealth and their economy while their population was slight, not growing much, was slightly growing. And they did it with their carbon emissions decreasing, not just absolutely in energy, not just absolutely in the entire economy, but uh, by a large amount, both absolutely and per unit of energy used and per Sounds. unit of wealth produced. All the, Sounds. any metric yeah. you could possibly use, except for one we'll talk about later that was used to to denigrate the success right. um, so, I mean, this is any possible metric, it was a success. Yeah. I mean, this, this podcast is called decouple and that, that is, I think kind of premier example of, of decoupling. So one that, one that we like to talk about and indeed just uh, again, to give, uh, we have quite the, um, quite the backlog of episodes to, to learn more about this. We have a great episode with Mirto Tripathi talking about France, uh, I'm going to forget the one word, but nous n'avons pas de, de l'huile, or we don't have like oil, mais nous avons des idées. Um, you know, this, this big build up urgency oil, you we talked about. We don't have about. gas, we don't have coal, but we have ideas. Yeah, yeah. And so in response to uh, the skyrocketing price of oil and fossil fuels, um, you know, that's why it happened. We have another great episode with François Perchet, um, who was a nuclear engineer um, around in that heyday in the 70s and 80s. 
and 90s working at EDF, building nuclear reactors called the preconditions um, of, of the Mesmer plan. So that's another great one um, if you want to learn more and get inspired about how it all began. Um, but we have um, some sadder tales to tell. And Mark, you have um, a great way of telling stories and you like to work in some pop culture references. So um, I believe there's a fairy tale that is going to help um, ground people in this discussion and, and maybe, uh, you know, a movie or pop culture reference. Let, let's uh, lay sure. the scene for us, Mark. I think that uh, people, uh, your listeners of a certain generation, especially those from the United States, will know the author Shel Silverstein, mm -hmm. who specialized in very funny, but quite dark and often very serious uh, fantasy and nonsense and uh, I guess, humorous poems for kids. So one of his most famous books is named after the title poem, which is The Giving Tree. And in The Giving Tree, there is a big tree and a boy that loves the tree. And the boy goes and visits the tree, sits under the tree's shade, gets apples from the tree. It's a, it's a wonderful relationship. And the tree is so happy to provide whatever she can um, for the boy. She loves the boy. The boy loves the tree. As the boy grows, the tree starts giving more and more, more apples, more branches, more uh, even its tree trunk. Uh, even the trunk of the tree gets used to carve the, uh, the <laughs> stages of the boy's life in the tree, starting with boy plus tree, you know, with a heart, and then boy plus his young love when he brings a girl. And he visits the tree less and less frequently as he gets older and starts eventually coming only when he needed large material sacrifices from the tree, eventually ending with cutting the entire tree down to a stump to use its wood. And at every stage, the tree wanted to give more and more and, and effectively was rationalizing how much of herself she was given, giving by saying how great a gift it was that she was giving all the way up until the destruction of her entire body. And of course, that means nobody else could get the gifts. And then finally, as an old man, the, the boy walks on over to the tree and there's almost nothing left the tree can provide. She says, I don't have apples. I don't have branches. I don't even have a trunk. And the old man says, it's okay. I don't have teeth anymore, so I can't even eat branches. And I have no, no need for almost <laughs> anything else except for a place to sit. So he sits his ass right down on the tree trunk and the, the tree's happy to be able to provide it again. A super awful and depressing tale, and I don't think it was written to, to show the theme of that it's good to be se right. uh, selfless and give yourself, but I think it's a perfect metaphor for the French nuclear fleet. And right. uh, to try to get the stages of the story matched up to where we are with the French nuclear fleet, we're somewhere in the cutting of almost all the main branches, and we're sizing up the trunk to see how much firewood or, or maybe even house construction material we could get, get out of it now that commodities are pretty expensive. That's where France is and its relationship yeah. with its own nuclear fleet. And, and before we get into your other analogy, I mean, let's, let's also just kind of set the scene, um, you know, without going into too much detail, but about, you know, what's, what's happening to Europe in the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what France could have been um, if it had managed its nuclear fleet um, as well as the Americans, I guess, or. Sure. Yeah. Let's do that. So sure. at its peak, the French nuclear fleet was producing 430, 440, 450 terawatt hours per year. To put terawatt hours per year in perspective for people, a uh, single productive nuclear reactor should be, depending on size, able to produce 5 to 10 terawatt hours of electricity per year. S entire small nations run off of a few dozen terawatt hours per year of electricity. Um, a giant city is going to need... Um, maybe, you know, a, a giant first world city may use a couple terawatt hours per year for it and surrounding industries. Uh, the United States runs through about, uh, 4,000 terawatt hours per year of which about 20% or 800 terawatt hours is coming from its, uh, world leading nuclear fleet in terms of size and output. So the French nuclear fleet, just to size it up for you, um, was making over half of the amount that the U.S. nuclear fleet was making, but in a country with much 
much smaller energy needs. Right. It might be better even for our purposes to look at it in terms of uh, instead of France being a, what, 65 million person country, that Europe is a billion people and needs energy for a billion people, has a grid that spans almost every country, and the French nuclear fleet would have been something like um, a quarter of that electricity. So almost the same percentage as that was of U.S. electricity consumption. You know, I, I tend to be, um, and, and I think you've, you've been able to balance this nicely for me, but, you know, I have biases towards, I guess, statism and, you know, public ownership. And it's, it's very interesting, and we'll probably make some French-American comparisons in terms of, you know, the, the U.S. sucks at, at building and licensing new reactors, but they're operating them exceptionally well. Um, and as you pointed out to me on a number of occasions, you know, great state-run builds like France or, or South Korea um, have utterly flopped if the state loses interest or if the state becomes actively anti-nuclear. That's such a vulnerability. And, I mean, certainly the regulatory body in terms of approving new reactors in the States is utterly dysfunctional and, and frankly, um, hostile, but you guys are running them well. So maybe we'll bookmark that for later, but again, just, you know, this is, I guess, kind of obvious, but in the context of what's going on, um, in European energy right now, if, if France was running at its peak, um, and able to deliver in the ways it has in the past, how, how would things look different for Europe right now? Well, if, if the French nuclear fleet were, increased in size per reactor, that is each reactor refurbished with larger steam generators, upgraded um, controls, upgraded uh, generators perhaps, then each French reactor could have gained the 10 to 25% extra power that most reactors of the exact same type around the entire planet have gotten. So you have most reactors around the world getting 10, 20% up, up, up rates. Okay. Up rates is the word. And not in France. So let's say they've done that. And let's say that instead of the catastrophically low production they're currently seeing, I said 430, 440, 450 was the, was the peak we've seen in the last decade. Well, they've fallen so low that this year we've heard claims that France will only make 300 terawatt hours oh. out of a fleet that is two-thirds the size of the American fleet. <laughs> They're going to make three-eighths of the electricity on a fleet two-thirds the size. That gives an approximate capacity factor of just below 60%. And th Most this is brought nuclear up fleets composed right. of the exact same reactors, uh, the reactor types, very mm -hmm. closely related designs, are above 90% in the rest of the world. Th this is brought up frequently uh, amongst anti-nuclear folks, even before the current fiasco, um, but the French, the French capacity factors are quite low. And my understanding is part of that is due to the French using their nuclear feet to heat with. And so they run all out in the winter, at least they used to. Um, and they, you know, they'll have layups for weekends and things like that when demand is low and they have a little more ability to, you know, do some response and things like that. I mean, they're also huge electricity exporters. You know, is it just not feasible to run such a large fleet at high capacity factors because there's not a market for that electricity during periods when French demand is low in the summer, say? Chris, we've heard those for years from people both pro-nuclear and anti-French nuclear, pro-nuclear, pro-French nuclear, anti-nuclear, anti-French nuclear. Anti nuclear. Yeah. We've heard all those same things. At the moment, a lot of those things are starting to look like excuses bad excuses, especially from the pro-nuclear folks. Oh, well, especially from French folks that I've talked to, they're saying things like, oh, don't worry. This was last fall. Don't worry about our low capacity factor now. We're optimizing to be there for the winter. Mm. As if you can just be bad at operations during this period, and you're going to magically be good at operations another period. Or that the reasons, the, the changes to your staffing, the changes to your work ethic, the changes to your approach that can allow you to just have an immense number of your reactors offline through a lot of the year can just be turned around during peak times. You know what? It was true for a bit. It was true for a while. And then you had, you had this sort of seasonal dipping and peaking, dipping and peaking, where in the summertime, you had very long, slow, stately reactor outages and refueling and re, re uh, you know, they, they call it the grand carénage, the, the operations to retrofit the fleet 
to be ready for the next few uh, decades of operation. Those things used to take place very steadily in the summer and in the winter. You would see reactors at full capacity. And the, the difference between American reactors being on essentially the whole year and French fleet kind of slackening off in the summer, that was the difference between the capacity factors, right? right. It wasn't the avail instant availability in, in winter when electricity was most needed. It was just the, the low production in the summer. But during the time when you saw that high winter, low summer, laws were being passed that were going to require much less nuclear electricity production. So there's this critical period about seven or eight years ago that set the stage for the crippling, devastating uh, changes we're seeing now in the French nuclear operational record, mm -hmm. which is during the time period where intense changes would have needed to be made to maintain high productivity in a future where there wasn't enough energy. Instead, the number one problem with the French nuclear fleet was seen that there was too much of it. Right. And, and so long-term investments mm -hmm. weren't made. Changes in, in staffing culture weren't made. Um, there's blame to go around. But in general, right. France, the elites in France, were sharpening their axes and licking their lips, looking at the amount of wood that they could get out of the trunk of the giving tree. And, and just remind me again, the decision and rationale. So there was a, a decision, I think, to go from 75% nuclear to 50%. And my understanding of the rationale was that, well, eventually all this shit's going to shut down. We built it in a very short period of time. So it's all going to have to retire at the same time. We better sort of ramp some of it down prematurely and start building other sources like wind and solar um, so that we have a smoother transition, presumably entirely away from nuclear one day. Was that, was that the thought? Like, I think it was uh, Hollande who was in power at that time. Um, am, am I, am I recollecting that well, or is there, there more to that? Story? You've been very generous in describing it. I think that's, that's an example of steel manning the argument. There we go. Yeah. Again, the claim is, well, we built these reactors suddenly. We want to turn them off. We, or sorry, want to turn them off and need to turn them off. We're combined as right. one argument. And whenever I was in France and I poked people, what do you mean you need to turn them off? And they're like, well, they're aging. And I say, "Why? they're not aging in the rest of the world. Why are they aging in France? And they're saying, well, w w since they need to shut off so quickly, we need to start shutting them down. And I would have to explain, you keep dancing around claiming that you have to shut them down. And by the way, Chris, this isn't just in the anti-nuclear ideologues. You can hear this from almost every French nuclear engineer. Almost every young French nuclear engineer I've talked to parroted the exact same line that they, of course, everyone knows, except for everyone else in the world, everyone knows that the French fleet has to shut down, right? Somehow they're not shutting down in other countries, but in France, they're just special. The reactors and, are very special and have to shut down. And so yeah. it's important to shut them down in an orderly fashion. Then the question is, why did they start with one of the only reactors that was confirmed to be ready to keep operating? That's Fessenheim back in 2016. Which had been refurbished or recarnerage. Yeah, whatever, 16 yeah. and 17. Okay. And the claim that I've heard from French nuclear engineers was, well, of course it's good to shut down our fleet because everyone knows you just have to shut down nuclear reactors. But why did they start with Fessenheim? We're so confused. And of course the answer is, the entire, the entire nuclear shutdown is actually ideological. The whole thing through and through. French mm. engineers, bless their hearts, are ideological too. And they're, they're just as vulnerable to ideology as all of us. For some time, this was a great thing. The ideology was make France great again after the yeah. embarrassment of World War II. And the ideology was I will go serve France, get a very competitive salary, get glory, get, uh, you know, cheaper free electricity, and in return, um, I will have this life mission that feels good and France will be strong again. That was, the, that was the way it worked. Now, French nuclear engineers see the only chance of regaining leadership as making new reactors, and it leads them to be extremely vulnerable, naive even, about their existing reactors. We have no evidence, Chris, that France is going to be good at all or should ever be involved with making new nuclear plants, right? Like, we don't well, we have we just don't have evidence. Right? <laughs> we have some, some evidence. It's not flattering.
Yeah, and, and maybe they can solve those issues, but things have gotten worse since then in mm-hmm. French nuclear. Not better, worse, Chris. Yeah. Less talent, l- lower performance, um, better political rhetoric at the top, but nothing that reveals that there's an understanding of what's gone wrong with the French nuclear fleet. And I think just in terms of the human factors element of this, you know, we did do an episode on Russia quite a while ago, and you were mentioning, you know, that Rosatom gets the absolute cream of the crop out of their engineering schools, et cetera. It's prestigious. I guess it's well-paying. Um, it's, it's you know, broadly looked up to within society to work at Rosatom. And I guess if you have um, an industry where the government is saying, you know, you're on your way out, um, it doesn't look as attractive and people take uh, for granted, I guess, what they have. And and I guess for young people, talented young people, it, it just doesn't have the luster. Is that is that accurate? How, like how much is, why is that affecting? Why don't I just tell a story in Glasgow for COP26, yeah. I go over and mingle with some, some uh, young Russians and I was talking to a lad and he was, he was very bright, very smart. He loved nuclear energy. In fact, he said that he had gone to a famous math and physics high school set up by uh, as a almost as a beneficial foundation if you will in the soviet sense by one of the great early leaders of the soviet nuclear program and he went to this math and physics high school did very well and then went to the top universities in moscow and i asked him well if you like nuclear so much are you are you working in nuclear and he said no that was for the smartest kids in my class. I always felt that my scores and test results, they were good, but they weren't, they weren't high enough to justify me getting a job at Rose Adam. So I said, mm-hmm. well, then where are you? And he said, Gazprom. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting. So um, yeah, Gazprom gets the, gets the second best, and then Rose Adam gets the first best, and then Rose Adam it gets to go around the world trying to clean up the energy mess left by the other policies of Russia to to cripple countries by getting them on cheap gas. Like that's what happened in Germany. That's what happened to Europe in general. So that's my little story. That was an interesting, interesting thing I heard directly from a talented uh, young Russian with great English skills, clearly a very strong technical education, but not quite good enough for nuclear in Russia. Right. More for more for natural gas. So, so yeah, they get the best. And in, in France, let me be clear, I asked a number of people who had, are either working in France now in the nuclear sector or know a bunch of people in the nuclear sector in France or are working outside of France on similar things. They all confirmed to me that the prestige and the honor remains for going to work for the state and for EDF. What does not remain is the financial edge, the competitive salaries. That's what I heard. That many of the perks and privileges of being an EDF employee have eroded. And that's, that's especially shocking to me because you would think that in modern times where uh, energy, even energy security, add that to the list of things people now care about, are so important, there should be nothing but all the best resources for the nuclear fleet if nothing else, because what it's bringing in. And I think that may bring us to our second recent pop culture uh, metaphor here. So in the, in the movie Mad Max, Fury Road, there's not enough resources to go around. So whichever brutal men have been able to corral the little remaining resources have been able to become warlords or kings or uh, local potentates. So there's a, there's a leader who's strong based on his control of water. There's very little water. The big bad in the movie has controlled the best supply of water around. And he uses that to uh, have a, a large army of ideologically motivated um, young men in various stages of failing health due to cancer or si- various sicknesses. Right. So One of the ways that the soldiers with failing health are able to support their beloved leader is by capturing outsiders and draining their healthy blood into themselves. So they get a blood type match and then they literally rig up some kind of way to drain out the blood of the healthy person to have one last go on maybe a suicide mission. So our hero in Mad Max, Max himself, is rigged up as a quote-unquote blood bag, a healthy donor drained for the dying gasps of a sick uh, recipient. And that is basically the situation we have 
today with the French nuclear fleet, where the French nuclear fleet is not just needing to hold up the sky, not just in France, but in the European energy system, but it's being bled repeatedly, multiple nozzles jammed straight into the veins to make sure that that money continues to support all sorts of parasitic programs. Some are particularly ironic. I want to mm. talk about a few of these programs. One, and uh, this is where I point at you. Can you can you pronounce uh, Aaron Shaw for uh, for everyone? Okay, I mean we do have some French listeners here, but I'll do my best. Accès régulé à l'électricité nucléaire historique. Right. So this is the equity mechanism, the fairness mechanism, where since the vast majority of of electricity in France is coming from one company's nuclear fleet, the idea was you could have a competitive electricity market by inducing a bunch of traders and energy companies to buy up nuclear electricity and to sell it onto their customers. What possible advantage this could have for the public is completely obscure to me. I guess the argument was that if there wasn't any competition and you raise electricity prices by including a bunch of middlemen, then that would somehow make there be more options for consumer. Like, this the is logic I mean, is yeah. inscrutable. It makes no sense. Even now, electricity markets are failing all over the world. But even by that standard, this never made sense. As far as I can determine, there were a few French ministers who worked from inside the, uh, the uh, palace to get Brussels to work with the French on tearing apart their own electricity economy. Is, so, is this like an EU-wide mandate that, you know, electricity has to be deregulated? Look, or, there's a lot of electricity-wide mandates. Countries that yeah. care about an issue can get anything blocked or okay. uh, carve out. Like, all over the EU, little countries that that are a tiny bit of the wealth and power and influence of France are able to block EU-wide yeah. issues until they get their way on on issues that they see as nationally important for either pride or economic reasons. If France had wanted to have a different setup, they could have. The truth is they thought that there was unlimited amounts of cheap nuclear electricity, that it would always be there until they didn't need it, and that all you had to do was figure out ways to take the wealth from the electricity. Like, to be clear, Cut I mean, down like the another way, and take the wealth. That was okay. considered the hardest problem right. in French electricity. Like a, a, you know, not a method I would support, but you, you can imagine another way of saying, okay, we're going to split the reactor fleet in two, and we're going to create competition, you know, between those fleets of reactors, and you know, that's how we're going to generate competition. No, in the no, market. no, no, like no. That, this that's wasn't how, about that. Would that would make sense, perhaps? But the, what you're describing just seems completely insane. Like, there's no mechanism for the electricity traders to outcompete or drive down prices. No, it's like Compared having Goldman Sachs brand electricity or having having total household power, even though they barely have any power plants because they aren't needed in France because they have an ele- a, a giant nuclear fleet. It was right. a way of, let's say consumers wanted to buy 100% renewable electricity, but only from wind and solar. Right. So since that's physically impossible, what they might do is buy a retailer power that promises 100% wind and solar. Then the retailer would go out, buy a giant block of, of uh, underpriced set contract price Arinsha electricity from Arinsha EDF. Johnson. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, and the, the what Arin I just pronounced. is what it yeah, looks yeah, like yeah. Yes, <laughs> okay. in, in English. Yeah. A-R-E-N-H. This is yeah. the adjustment mechanism for historical state investments in, in nuclear. So they these middlemen, these traders, these other energy companies, in order to sell power at any kind of rates that are even close to what EDF is able to do, since they have a giant, cheap, already decarbonized nuclear fleet, right? Like they already have what France needed. The competitors could take some nuclear power, flip it for a big profit, and then buy some renewables contracts and say to their customers, oh yeah, totally, we got you. So here's some aspects of that that make this blood bag program so bad. Here's one. These competitors are not required to buy the nuclear electricity, but EDF is required to offer it at a fixed rate. That means that if this is a year where prices are so low that the nuclear fleet is just going to bleed out, it's just going to suffer from low prices, then 
other retailers don't have to take that risk, don't have to take any losses from having that nuclear power. On the other hand, if it's a year that because of high fossil prices or an electricity crisis or anything, if it's a year of bad renewables and electricity prices are high, and they right. think that that's what's happening the year before, that they, they're looking ahead, their they competitors are looking ahead, high. they can buy low and sell high without having to take in the downside risk of buying every year. Now, here's another part. Let's say these electricity traders buy the electricity, and then there's an act of God. There's a force majeure event like uh, COVID. Right. Now, you would think maybe if the French were trying to keep their national electricity system up and running and, and help wean uh, Europe off of Russian gas, maybe the idea should be private traders should suffer big losses to support the public entity, right? In other words, maybe those traders should be required to buy that electricity even if it isn't be to be uh, you know profitable in order to keep their license to sell electricity in France or something like that. That would be a way of making sure that the French nuclear fleet still, you know, maintained its revenue through thick and thin. Instead, not only was it the opposite system, they don't have to buy, they don't have to partake in that downside. If they accidentally get hit by downside, like buying a full amount of this electricity. So in the case of France, remember we said at least 400 terawatt hours, that's what France should be producing every year. About 300 is what it seems that it's going to be producing this year. The Arinsha mechanism is not a percentage of that. It's a flat 100 terawatt hours, nation scale energy wow. that is required to be offered at a rate too low to renovate the fleet, <laughs> much less build new reactors. <laughs> yeah, it's too low to renovate the fleet. And that price. That price, that's what electricity traders bought at the end of 2019, looking ahead to 2020. Right. Okay. When COVID hit, electricity demand tanked. I was a little bit gleeful. I was like, ha, that'll teach them. Now the French nuclear fleet has 100 terawatt hours that it for sure has sold at amounts that will at least may hopefully make it break even for that power this year. That's good. Right. That's really good because a lot of energy companies are suffering losses. No, these fossil fuel companies like Total went to court in France and they said, well, we didn't know that there just wouldn't be a need for this electricity. So we need out of our contracts. And EDF lost. <laughs> and they had to take on all that electricity that they'd been forced to offer and forced to sell at right. prices too low to renovate the fleet. And they were forced to take the electricity back and sell it at a loss. Jesus Christ. And just to be clear, EDF, I mean, and to get a little bit of historical context here, it's uh, the national uh, electricity generator made after the war. Um, and it's exclusively nuclear or almost entirely nuclear. Um, just just give us a bit more, like, and we've talked about this a bit with Mirto Tripathi, but just EDF as a, as a construct, if you can just clarify for our listeners, you know, some of whom might be from the States and be more familiar with, you know, regulated utility monopolies, like just what what is EDF? Just, just so we have a clear understanding. Yeah, it's the state... It's the state electricity. I can't really say monopoly now because these stupid mechanisms for bleeding off the, the economic rents that these nuclear reactors should be making, that, that makes it to where there's competitors. So technically it isn't a monopoly. But here's the thing. A lot of countries made these monopolies after World War II mm -hmm. because it is, a, it is an institutional match to the physical reality of an electricity grid. Mm. You're not going to have competing wires to see who, you know, like two plugs in your house and plug into one based on which company is offering you better electricity grid service that day. And you're not, right. I mean, almost every attempt to make it not be a monopoly is essentially fraud. Um, mm -hmm. It's fraudulent academics. It's, it's honest business according to fraudulent rules, sometimes fraudulent business according to fraudulent rules. Um, and in the end, it defrauds the citizen of the cheapest possible electricity. The right. claim is that if you started to break up authority for this extremely unitary physical system, and when I say unitary, I mean real unitary. Like it is, uh, it's one frequency across the whole European continent. Only a few countries aren't part of that, or a few, a few tiny areas aren't part of that pan-European uh, synchronized grid. Or the United States, um, everything from... Where you're sitting right now, to me in Chicago, to the tip of Florida, that's one frequency, Chris. Right. 
Now, maybe it's sensible that it's broken up into various regions where there's a bunch of people and a bunch of generation here, and then a bunch of people and a bunch of generation here. And even though the grid ties together at a few points, as long as these two sides each take care of their own, they'll have mm -hmm. a little to take care of each other. So that's, that's how it can maybe work. But it makes almost no sense for a country the size of France to have competing electricity providers. Um, and so the attempt to force EDF, and I mean, this ha again, like I said, it happened in other countries. So UK had a nationalized electricity uh, system coming out of the Central Electricity Generation Board, CEGB. And that is, the, that is just a group of dudes sitting around, smoking their pipes, deciding how to do electricity, right? Mm -hmm. Planning ahead, we, we expect this much load, so let's make sure we have this amount of base load power and a little bit of peaking. We expect this much load, so let's have this amount of base load power, that amount of bit of peaking. Right. Hey, Bob, how's the coal fleet in that region doing? Is it going to be available? Yeah, we're, we're up maintaining it, but you should go ahead and plan a little extra capacity since some of the stuff is aging. And Anyway, I'm making a sort of story, uh, just so story out of it, but really, you kind of planned out the power plants you needed, planned out the different types of power plants so that the total mix made the lowest total cost of national generation, Right. And then you supplied it to everybody. And if you did what France did, which was overbuild too many nuclear plants based on needs, you do what France did and promote the use of electricity in homes and, and businesses. For rail, for heating, et cetera. Now, quick for question, everything. Mark. For everything. Because a, you know, a big thing I'm struggling with these days is you know, how, on, how on earth do we get nuclear built and how do we finance it? And it would strike me that you know, both the large regulated monopoly, private monopoly model in the States... Um, and a large unitary um, national utility um, offer the benefit of de-risking capital, right? If you have big, big entities, it just makes sense. They, they're more secure. Um, they're going to be able to get and guarantee um, private capital that comes in to fund their new projects. Is that, is that part of it? And is that part of the struggle nowadays with, with um, de deregulated markets and, and, and you know, breaking up um, of, of these traditional monopolies? So the deregulated markets, as a, as a first order statement, that's just always going to be true, do not work to incentivize generation investment over the long term. Okay. The markets were set up in specific, like the, a lot of the first markets were set up in places that happen to have a lot of natural gas production at that moment. Maybe not in the future, maybe not forever, certainly not forever, but maybe not like even a few years after the start of these markets, would there be so much natural gas? But the idea was this. If you make the market, then you could take nuclear plants and coal plants that had not nearly amortized yet, that had was, were nowhere near the end of their lives, and therefore were part of the lowest total cost investment plan to make electricity at the lowest rates. And you could jump in make catastrophic losses for the owners of those plants, just destroy mass quantities of capital, and then build new power plants that were marginally cheaper during the period that natural gas was right. cheap. Gotcha. There was no plan for what do you do after the natural gas isn't cheap anymore? What happens if you don't get the balance of like regulation and market right? There was no plan for what if you actually break the system so badly that no one can even Contem no one can even understand how they could get money back for any type of power plant because the electricity price is going like this, like crazy. Right. And because of the fact that electricity is political, it yeah. is political. It's, it's the basis of modern life that if you start messing with electricity, the politicians who obviously cannot understand it, I mean, the experts don't understand it. Almost all the smartest experts I talk to, talk to about electricity, if they're being honest, they're struggling right now. They're like, I, I just not, I'm not sure how this is going. I, I can't figure out X, Y, and Z. I was in New York with a brilliant gentleman, fascinating, brilliant gentleman who's made his career understanding electricity and explaining it to people and making money off of it. And he's like, I can't tell what's yeah. happening or what's going. I can't see where this yeah. is going or how it ends up well. Get, so that's back. the situation. Yeah. And if you do want nuclear plants built, there's the stuff that nuclear people need to do, which is get our shit together. And then there's stuff that the, that the state or the utility or the regulators or, or something has to do to end this absolute nonsense that we are somehow from radically chaotic electricity prices 
going to induce investment in ultra long, long lived electricity production. Right. We're not going to do it. We're going to do short term band aids. We're going to break the system. We're going to have permanently higher costs. This is the way I'd put it. Both California and Texas are failing in very similar ways, coming from radically different political standpoints, right. radically mm -hmm. different approaches. The commonality is electricity markets that are now about 20 years old each, combined with a very large amount of investment in power plants that turn off whenever they want to, whenever, mm -hmm. whenever they don't, not even whenever they want to, that are forced to turn off because of the weather. That's the big thing. And people can say, oh, gas had to turn off because of the weather. Fine. How are you going to get a gas plant to spend a huge amount of money weatherizing when if they do that, it means they'll be available during a big freeze, which means that there won't be a price spike, which means that they'll never recover their costs. Like, how do you, how could you, that if you fix that, it sounds like not a market, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's, so let's, yeah, let's, let's get back. Going back to France, and just, I would just, want to say. And what, just one more question a, for you. Okay. One more question as, as we're moving back across the pond, because I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to sort of devil's advocate or steel man a, a way in which France could deregulate that would improve performance of their fleet. And I think I was floating it before, which was, and again, this doesn't fit with my politics per se, but like if, if generation were broken up and you had plants competing against each other, then perhaps their performances would, would improve and that might replicate to some degree the American model, which again, operationally has been excellent. Is that, does that make any sense? I've heard very smart, very well-meaning French uh, colleagues and, and advocates say that this is the way forward, that you have to get out of this statist, communist even thinking where um, big state will always take care of you, but also must be served. Like they've, you've got to break apart the fleet and actually have some competitive pressure. The way I, I have to warn them is that the second they do this, they break apart the nuclear industry. In the U.S., there's no nuclear industry. Yeah. Each nuclear power uh, utility that competes against another utility wants to see that utility's nuclear plant die. Right. I have seen reports from inside some of the biggest operators of nuclear plants, strategy guides for how to get their competitors' nuclear plants destroyed. Right. I've right. seen it with my own eyes, Chris. Okay. They know that this is what you do to survive. For your brand to survive in a time when there's not enough electricity customers to go around. Okay. So I do I think the first thing that would happen if you split up the fleet is that you would lose an entire swath of nuclear plants down to about 30%, 35% of French nuclear supply or French electricity supply. Yeah. In other words, an absolutely permanent crisis that if the politicians respond to that crisis by cutting revenue at the nuclear plants, then you haven't actually achieved right. anything. Right, right, right. Okay. And that's, There's of winners, course, what win, they would Winners do. and losers and the lunars and losers You would, you would break apart a yeah. big, weak fleet into a much smaller, weak fleet. That's gotcha. what two okay. two smaller weak to medium strength fleets. That's so. What there's would there's happen. more to the blood bag here. Right? You've talked yeah, about yeah. There the, is. There's, uh, a, there's a very dangerous one. Yeah. So let's let's continue there. And I think yeah. Let's let's hear about it. CSPE. Let's have the French. Contribution au service public de l'électricité. De l'électricité. <laughs> now French, man, speaking have French, some... you really got it. Your mouth moves a lot. It's crazy. Anyway, carry on, Mark. Not mine because I <laughs> it's can't. It's a speak workout. <laughs> so the CSPE is the contribution to the public provision of electricity is, is how I would translate it, even if it's not exactly literal. So okay. what this is, is a 23 euro per megawatt hour tax, about $23 if we convert from euro to dollar at current exchange rates. So 23 uh, euros or $23 USD per megawatt hour tax on all electricity sold to pay for mainly replacing the cheap nuclear you already have with inconsistent renewables from private companies you don't have already. Right. So, right. So the contribution to the public service of electricity is to break apart the public service of electricity, damage the system jack up prices, and then tax it all to fin send that back to fly-by-night foreign companies that build a winter solar plant, and then the grid has to, has, has to raise its own charges to pay for the expanded grid and the difficult management, grid management, in order to get the renewables on the grid to do nothing for carbon. Nothing. Right. Because they decarbonized already. Right. It's, it's a true example of privatize the profit, socialize the cost. It's, it's institutionalized. And, it, and, it, and it's deeper than any other version I've ever heard where it's almost entirely parasitic. 
And here's the other funny thing. Because the wind and solar is so expensive, EDF is not actually authorized to collect enough money from its customers to pay all the bills, even with that giant tax. So EDF is required to keep up to, at different times, billions of euros of debt on its books because it was required to pay out the wind and solar companies before enough money had been raised on a tax, mainly on carbon-free nuclear power, in order to pay for these renewables that were not physically needed the vast majority of the hours they're on the grid. Think about this. France is a winter-peaking country, and it has very little sun in the winter. And yet, the solar, the solar that, you know, it imports from super-tainted and sketchy solar supply chains in China to set up to produce summertime electricity when it's least needed, least needed. And if they really needed solar in the summer, you can get it from Spain because they're messing up their energy even worse, right? Yeah. So then the solar it goes into the grid at guaranteed extremely high rates, whether it's needed or not, and that money has to be collected out of taxing all the nuclear and then sent to the solar company at rates greater than the tax actually comes in, leaving debt on EDF's books and leading competitors to say, man, that nuclear fleet's a real mess. Do you see how much debt EDF is in? So, Mark, like, what's, what's explaining the culture behind this? I guess, I mean, this is regulatory culture. This is legal culture in terms of what you were describing before with, uh, you know, what happened around COVID and, and EDF losing that legal battle to uh, not have to, I guess, take back the electricity that sold in 2019. Um, you know, what, what explains this? You know, going back from the uh, radiance of France, those kind of glory days in the 80s, like, what the fuck happened? Well, how, did, did France, was, how did France turn so anti-nuclear in, the, in its very establishment? Um, to to generate these kind of policies that are, again, bleeding bleeding out Mad Max or a hero here? In short, big, powerful state was used to build nuclear. That was at a time when the state wasn't that powerful compared to what it used to be in the world. So Germany invades, conquers France easily. France has to wait around for liberation. The, the folks that did not wait around, that risked their lives every day, either in the Free French Forces or the um, or in the resistance, those people become the next leaders of France, right. okay? They want to get rid of the shame and the embarrassment of defeat. One of the ways is to make France glorious again. At the same time, France is losing so many of its large land-based overseas colonies, and the ones that it has remaining are recipients of money from France, not exactly um, <laughs> supplying money. So France is then out of almost all fossil fuels and builds up a bunch of grand programs, grand engineering programs and trains, in, in military technology, in telecommunications, in electricity. The program in electricity was nuclear. The tool was EDF and Framatome. So, right, that's a very quick story. Those hard men that were made hard by hard times, they have passed on. A few of them survive as living legends. Most famously, Marcel Boitou, who survived assassination attempts to build out the system that is by, now by being green destroyed. activists, right? By I mean, I think yeah, it was like Red Army faction meets you know Greenpeace. <laughs> no, they hated that he was just making a bunch of nuclear. They hated more that it was associated with the state. And so here's the other thing: if you were super far left and you're out of power and you see your battle as environmentalism or soft energy or whatever, a big mess of all sorts of competing vibes that all come into one big thing, which is. State is bad, nuclear is bad, military is state, military is nuclear, nuclear is all those. If we get rid of all the nuclear, then we're headed towards a better future. Um, this thinking was extremely weak in the state and in the elites. Mm -hmm. Instead, it grew in popular culture. Instead, it grew in media. Instead, it grew in schools. So the school teachers totally, totally conquered by this anti-nuclear degrowth ideology, right? right. So... When that generation grew up, when France succeeded in making a giant nuclear fleet, when they had the good life, then is when the rot really took hold because it made decisions about who should be energy minister almost arbitrary. What are you going to do? Just sit there and get a report that says, we made all this power this year and it remains cheap. Okay, mm -hmm. next year. We made all this power this year and it's still cheap. What do you even do? You need something to do, Chris. So what you do is you start messing with the energy system, right? You start, you start making it to where the people in charge of electricity have no comprehension at all what electricity is, 
what, how you measure it, what costs mean, what's a wire, what's a nuclear, blah, 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 it's too, too much. Instead, right. you've, got, you've got big administration abilities. You went to ENA, the Ecole Nationale d'Administration. You and all your buddies know that it's just spreadsheets and hiring people who know spreadsheets. And then that means that you kind of go on your intuition, but then you get a spreadsheet to show that your intuition was actually right. And anyway, all that's dumb. It's about state dinners, um, uh, going on TV, and big vibes, right? So sure. the energy system in many European countries, especially the most powerful ones, got put under ecology ministries because there's, you know, because climate change means you have to do all these changes, even if you already saw climate change, mostly in your country, like France with its electricity system and high degree of electrification, you got to make an ecological transition. What is that? It means getting rid of nuclear. So those people were in charge for a really long time. The various market liberalizations, well, it didn't make sense for France, but you did it anyway because it was another pathway to undercut the fleet. Right. You can't restore your nuclear plants to operation if we take all your revenue. You can't build new ones if we gut you like a fish, right? So that's the so, that was the know, idea. In Belgium, there's a green minister of energy. Maybe her her portfolio is also you know minister of the ecological transition. I'm not sure, but she is obviously actively anti nuclear and actively invested in replacing the Belgian fleet with gas. I mean, are there characters like that within the French system who are actively Absolutely. ideologically anti nuclear, yes. or are yes. they just doing and they this through, and, and they get appointed yeah. and they get appointed ecological transition minister. That's the way it works. Oh, this it's, person it's is kind of ecological yeah. like, so we're going to put them in charge of energy. Okay, that's the way it yeah. works. Oh, it's, it's here's a TV presenter. He goes mm. on the news and talks about nature. Let's put him in charge of electricity at the same time that we pass a law that says we have to get rid of about a third of our nuclear fleet. That's the energy transition law of 2015, ecological transition law that was put into place in order to cripple the French nuclear fleet. It has succeeded, Chris, even yeah. though Macron came in and was like, oh, maybe I don't want this anymore. Well, they didn't change anything. They didn't repair the damage. They didn't cancel Aaron Shaw. They didn't, they didn't undo the CSPE. They didn't start blocking these parasitic firms and technologies from messing up the, some of the cheapest and cleanest electricity that's ever existed. They didn't do any of that. They just announced that, oh, we're pro-nuclear now. That's what happened. And I mean, I think it's it's easy, you know, as those of us in the pro-nuclear movement cast our eyes around longingly for the occasional good news. And we get some, you know, Byron and Dresden. Uh, we save some nuclear plants here and there. Um, but, you know, we heard, um, you know, Macron make, uh, you know, a bit of an about face. I think he'd originally supported the, the partial phase out um, and then came out saying, you know, we're going to build, you know, maybe 14 new EPRs, you know, embracing nuclear again, releasing a really sexy eco-modernist video, La Rêve est Possible. Um, you know, one felt that there was a bit of a, a changing, a changing wind in France. Um, but we're seeing that the fleet is going to have one of its year, worst years ever, uh, forecasted for such a critical time in European energy when EU is, is trying to get off Russian fossil fuels within five years. Um, and a replacement is desperately needed. So, you know, are things changing? Is that your sense at all? Um, or is this going to take a long time? It's not clear there's any understanding of the institutional changes necessary at EDF. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, even though it's clear now that electricity markets are essentially bullshit, there's not, it's not clear that it's going to change thinking at the EU level other than countries quietly subverting the market in their own ways. So, for example, folks I talk to who know the German system say that, yeah, Germany has been subverting. Germany has been doing everything it could to pretend to be part of the market but has actually been keeping its thumbs on the scales in order to keep their coal fleet alive. So that's something I've suspected for a long time. I'm like, how can the German coal fleet keep operating with such a big carbon tax and such bad economics, blah, blah, blah? Well, it's because the Germans have been cheating, basically. So they've been cheating, and that's the thing that really gets me. The Germans are cheating to keep their coal plants, but France <laughs> refuses French, yeah. to do it to, to keep up their nuclear plants. That's the difference. The Germans are hyper-competent at whatever goal, evil or benign, they choose. And the French are a mess, even when they're on technically the right side. So I don't know. Look, here's what. Here, let me give you an example. The unions. I have had only the most wonderful experience talking with the unions in France. I met with some of them in person um, when we were traveling there to try to save Fessenheim. And, of course, they were deeply worried and very angry about Fessenheim being shut down for no particular reason at all. But like, if you wanted the outages to be a lot shorter, yeah. 
you would need a lot of concessions from the unions. And it's not clear whether they're ready for that or would be willing, how much you would have to spend to buy off the unions to have longer hours, a much more intense and rigorous work schedule to both maintain the plants so that outages could be shorter, maintenance right. before, between outages, but also, you know, in the U.S., outages are 24 hours a day. Every second, there's a swarm of people on, huge staffing on right. the job, both employees and contractors, until the job is done. And then it goes back online. It's like the, it's an F1 pit stop versus somebody tinkering with a car for a year in their garage. That's maybe a little right. mean, and I hope I don't get too much hate from my from my beloved uh, French colleagues and friends. But that's that's the way I illustrate it to your listeners, right. where we need this F1 pit stop. Okay, we don't need tinkering in the garage, but that's what we have. French regulator. The French regulator has a single-minded purpose, and by God, they do it. Any little problem leads to France shutting down its reactors as quickly as possible. Now, I can see both sides of this issue. If very serious maintenance problems were not seen and then are suddenly uncovered, that is a bad sign. It, may, it indicates there might be other things wrong. I have a lot of sympathy for this latest wave of problems where a backup safety system is being found to be in a state where you cannot... I've, I've asked people this. I've said, can you guarantee that if that system were called into function, it would respond as designed. And there's been a little bit of hedging. It probably would, but I see that as a problem along the orders of not getting the seawall at Fukushima Daiichi pushed up high enough. Right. It needs to be done. A black swan event at the could, same could time lead to the the, the fix should not be. Yeah. The cure yeah. should not be worse than the than the problem. And if there are extremely severe shortages of electricity that lead to deaths, then that has to be weighed too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting that the oldest nuclear plants, that is the type that Fessenheim was, did not have the problems that right. are facing the newer ones. And yet those were the ones that everyone said had to shut down because if you're going to shut them down anyway, you start with the oldest. Right. There's an irony for you, Chris, that specifically the ones that were claimed to be weakest just because they were old, those are the ones that are now strongest because they're old and they didn't have the design change made by the French to the Westinghouse um, mm -hmm. reactors that led to the current crop of, of cracking, the current crop of crack, cracks that is uh, shutting down these plants. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and, you know, we have an episode on titled Are Nuclear Plants Immortal, which people should definitely check out. But, you know, there's a lot more detail in it there. Oh, and sorry, it's, things are things, things are ringing familiar EDF for leadership. Me. Yeah, I mean, just just in terms of here in Canada, you know, we're fighting to save the the Pickering nuclear station, and you know, its pressure tubes are actually aging the slowest of the entire fleet. You know, so it's one of the older reactors, um, and it's uh, it's performing very well, better than ever, basically. And yeah, if you actually objectively look at the components that you need to worry about, it's it's performing the best. It's got the most longevity. Um, and so, I mean, this whole thing of you know, okay, these are the oldest plants. This is all, I guess, based on. Okay, these things have been designed arbitrarily by an, an engineer, an engineering firm, and they've said, okay, we're going to guess this is a plant that has a 40-year lifespan. But it sounds like amongst even the engineering class, but particularly amongst the public, there's not been an updated idea of like, that was a you know hypothetical design life, but we need to assess longevity and, and what we can fix and what we can extend based upon actual analysis and measurement. Yeah, so there's a lot of confusion when people try to use analogies. Is a nuclear reactor like a space shuttle? Is it like an airplane? Is it like a bridge? Is it like a dam? Mm. And the truth is different parts of the nuclear plant are like those various things. There are parts of a nuclear plant that are a little bit like the body of a jet airliner and they they need to be they need to be refurbished if you can, right? There are other parts of nuclear plants that are like the dome of uh, you know, the Pantheon in Rome, which is now going on 2000. It, so it, the different parts need to be seen as the components they are. And if the components can be replaced or the components are fine, then the whole is going to be okay because that's the thing that is being looked at every single day by a swarm of ultra-motivated, ultra-competent people in almost all cases. Um, and in which terms brings of the French us back to the... In, in terms of the French regulator, the other thing, uh, like in there, I, and I really should learn this word, the rec carnivage or whatever, the refurbishments, 
um, they're they're tasking those older reactors to meet the same kind of safety qualifications as the Gen three plus EPR. Is that correct? Like, I mean, not quite adding double containment, but um, that's that's onerous from what I understand. How necessary yeah, are, just, is that? Let me let me be real blunt. PWRs, if they have a strong shell to keep the shit in, if you melt it, then what you do is to make sure you have all your staff really well trained with all the lessons from Fukushima Daiichi and Three Mile Island, and then you're good. That's the that's what I'd say. You have emergency preparedness, defense in depth, a thick containment. You're okay. Every that's what it takes to make it to where no plausible accident leads to health damage from radiation. Everything else is public affairs. Everything else is public communication and honesty and a disaster preparedness. Mm-hmm. So making the claims that you have to upgrade these plants to some level of safety that is determined mathematically based on calculations done for a newer type of reactor, that is an ideological decision. And it's one that if enforced, as they're attempting to do in Belgium, will lead to devastating societal repercussions like mm-hmm. what we're seeing now. Mm-hmm. Now, so, I want to say that EDF management uh, should not go unmentioned. So when I met with managers of Fessenheim Nuclear Plant in 2017, uh, one of them confided in me that the way to get promoted at EDF was to be involved with renewables, not nuclear, that almost everyone in upper management and on their way up in EDF was coming from the renewable side, that it was leading to a lot of opportunism of people jumping into EDF not to serve the state or not to, for all those other goals we we talked about, but because they saw renewables as being very high growth within EDF in the future. And the way he put it is that at the time, renewables were 10% of the revenue, but less than 5% of the profits. But the vast majority of promotions and upper management were going to the renewables people. And what I've heard from multiple other sources is that if you're at EDF and you bring up problems, even along with solutions, not even not as a whistleblower, but because you see good ways to do things to maximize uh, operational efficiency and uptime at the plants, it's more likely that you will be fired than promoted. Mm. And also not very likely that you'll be listened to. So good, and I say fired, okay, so it's a little bit hard to get fired from EDF, but you will, you will, your life will be made unpleasant. That very talented leaders eventually have to rise up and out of EDF. And that starts at the top. That is a failure of leadership from the very top. Look, there are disadvantages to a centralized system. The advantage is if you have really good leadership, you should be able to make a very large amount of change. Mm-hmm. And you can start, you can start by ending the parasitic scams that that end up dumping really high costs on the consumers for no gain at all, that tear out the economic rent of the nuclear fleet and subvert the entire idea of having a market in the first place. Chris, if the market price is really high for any nuclear plant that's on, then that should indicate that nuclear should be at maximum production, right? Mm-hmm. That if you are looking at the need for a base load for the several thousand terawatt hours that Europe uses each year, and you need a base for that, you need security of supply, and it needs to come from Europe, then what you need is a French nuclear fleet at 600 terawatt hours per year, not at 300, which with US operational efficiency and with uh, up ratings and an end to closures, you can get that. But there need to be interconnections that are expanded, which gets us back to Brussels in the end. Yeah. Brussels said we need a big, strong interconnected grid and market prices so that the best low carbon competitors can get to everywhere. But not you, France, because we hate nuclear. So they built an ideology where only nuclear can really do it and then said, but not nuclear, and then crippled it. That's at the, just summarizing what I see in the breakdown of energy in Europe today. And by what means did Brussels... Did Brussels do that? They didn't allow them to build the interconnectors or? So EDF has been told effectively for decades now not to prioritize output. That output and and market and share and, and profit, all of these things are considered to be evil. Now, part of the logic on the inside of EDF is that if we reduce production, we'll increase profits. But then the profits get taken. On the outside, it is, Let's get them to reduce production so there's less nuclear. If that causes the cost to go up, we'll take them. So there's a perfect 
perfect um, goat rodeo going on there. Just a complete, absolute disaster compared to the stated goals for all parties. Yeah. Here's another thing. If you're, if you're trying to reduce production and you don't want to turn off reactors, one of the ways to do it is to not have interconnections that could lead to more production demand during the summer months. Sure. Right? Because, of course, why is, why is Germany's coal supposed to be the base load and not French nuclear? Why are we turning off the French nuclear plants before the, French, the German coal? Because they're all really strongly connected and can be even more connected. If the claim is, no, we don't want French nuclear to outcompete the coal of Germany, then what was the carbon tax for? What's energy security concerns for? What are air pollution regulations for? What's any of this all for, Chris? Right. It's, it's, it's complete nonsense to have a system set up to benefit exactly something like a French nuclear fleet in terms of all your goals, but then to cripple the French nuclear fleet because you don't like it and to not have anything that can fill the gap except for Russian gas. That's what they did. It is extraordinary that the German coal fleet is is running very well. You're not hearing these kind of problems. I, I imagine their capacity factors are very, very good. They're they're paying a high carbon availability tax. availability factor is good. Capacity yeah. factors have been low enough that if it were just on economics, most of that coal should have shut down, but hasn't right. because right. there's the Germans are good at protecting their interest. The French can't even identify what their interests are and right. still try to. I just think it's such an interesting compare and contrast there, and uh, you know, worthy of worthy of diving in deeper. We're we're kind of getting towards uh, the end of our time, um, and I guess this is this is a moment to ask you that cheesy question of you know, kind of what what gives you hope or what what hope is there? Do you see any promising moves? Um, you know, what is to be done? What's what's necessary? And you know, I <laughs> I ask my my. Uh, guess this question often towards the end of an episode when there's there's not time to explore it and it's a lot to sort of take on and and suggest but maybe if you can kind of keep it abstract um what are your ideas or suggestions as to how to fix this rot how to take the uh intravenous catheters out of the blood bag how to prevent the final logging to a stump and maybe allow some of those branches to spring forth with new foliage like a prune tree rather than a butcher tree um let, let us have it mark What's your prescription sure. here? So what we're seeing with EDF is what happens when EDF is under an immense amount of pain, but with no, no understanding in society and no political will to change it. Now, we still haven't seen the political will to change it. It's still not clear whether society understands, but the pain is shared. Everybody is starting to feel this pain. And, you know, even though French, the French public is being protected, from a lot of the energy price shocks and electricity that other countries are seeing. And of course, how are they protecting it? A few more big old needles in every vein you can find in EDF. Like EDF, they expanded Arinshaw and, and forced EDF, which had already sold that extra power, to buy it back at the high price in order to sell it again at the low price. Right, so those jabbers are still going straight into EDF's necks. Uh, but EDF is clearly reaching like a point where its production is collapsing. It's, it's collapsing faster than anyone could have ever imagined. And in the end, that pain will have to be shared to mm -hmm. the French public. And they will eventually demand answers. And even if answers aren't forthcoming, leaders will cycle through until somebody gets up there and reforms EDF. That's, I think, it's, my... It's so, it's so goddamn reactive. Well, how about crazy. this? How about this? Here's another little bit of light that maybe is better. French folks I talk to say that the best path they see now, and they see there's some chance, there's some chance they can see that this will happen, is that you take EDF entirely out of energy sales of every type. And instead, EDF is just told, we need this amount of production. What do you need in order to get it? Right. And that could, if, if done well, could maybe stop EDF from doing thinking that it's an energy trade or attempting within a completely broken market that doesn't make any sense. We didn't, we didn't talk to it. This, uh, we didn't talk to this point, and the time is almost over, but EDF's energy trading division is a famous catastrophe. Some of the worst traders ever have made them, their public names by losing hundreds of millions of dollars for their, their trading arms, trading EDF and other electricity. So that's been a catastrophe, and EDF does all sorts of weird things that look possibly like uh, market manipulations where they turn down nuclear plants in order to keep gas plants running. Like it's, 
It's really perverse in an energy crisis. All of that nonsense hopefully could be eliminated if EDF is just told, we need you to hit 440 terawatt hours a year, every single year, what do you need in right. order to do it? Well, what they need is, is, is some money to do it. And that's what, you know, and they need blood in the bag, essentially. Um, and that's what I think they, is a huge tragedy this, here. Chris, if you're gonna build, if you're they gonna have good bone marrow. They have good <laughs> bone marrow so far. Only some of their okay. bones have rotted. Hopefully there isn't cancer. Right. We'll see if they are able to fix the cracks in the safety, the safety right. backup system. Right. Um, that there's enough healthy bone marrow yeah. that they may not need a transplant. They may need just time to recover and regrow and right. a bunch of uh, a bunch of a chicken broth. Yeah. Okay. All right, Mark. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in terms of just getting the fleet where it should be, let alone building new plants, they're going to need, they're going to need resources. They're going to need good bone marrow. Um, okay. Thank you for the entertaining story. This, this, uh, tragic comedy, whatever it is. Um, and, and for a little bit of hope at the end there, Mark, um, this show has been a long time coming. Uh, really glad that we could sit down and make it happen. Um, just a reminder as well, where can people find you? Twitter's best. And you at have your D energy bands at energy bands. Yeah. We'll link that. And you have your DMS open. Um, and I know you make a real point of, you know, talking to people individually. Um, you know, that's how we met and, uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a great collab. <laughs> so thanks for coming back uh, as the, uh, you know, most frequent guest on decouple. We've missed you for the last few months. Good to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me.